pero pero esta la que hemos hecho esta los últimos años que era que era oscuro ya pero eso sí se ve de hecho pero sí que se ve mucho mucho más Tienes que evitar la the first one in Italy, in the International School for Advanced Study in Trieste, and then, no, the first one in Cold Spring Harbor in, in New York, and then in the International School for Advanced Study in Trieste, and after that he returned to Spain as a Ramon y Cajal Fellow in the Institute of Neurociencia de Alicante uh, for four years, and since uh, 2008 he got a permanent position of the Research Council, he's a, a scientific titular of the CSIC, and uh, he works, he works uh, in neuroscience, as I said, but mainly he's interested in interaction between structure and function in the, in the cerebral cortex of rodents, as he's going to explain. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so first of all, let me uh, thank you for, for inviting me to this um, very impressive institute. It's, it's really pleasure to be here. So, um, and uh, so uh, we work uh, in the uh, rodent uh, tactile system, specifically in the rodent, in the system that carries information from the whisker pad of the animal to the uh, cerebral cortex. And uh, the reason why I've colored the, these areas is because in the anatomy of the cerebral cortex we can find uh, specific regions that uh, contain neurons that respond uh, specifically or, or preferentially to particular whiskers on the snout of the animal. And this, is, this organization has been known for several decades, and it serves as a, as a very standard model system for looking at uh, the structure of maps, of sensory maps. And um, as many of you probably know, there's a very uh, uh, eye-catching map in the somatosensory cortex of humans, whereby we have a systematic representation of our sensory organs, of our tactile skin organs, on the surface of the cortex, and the biggest areas correspond to the uh, uh, parts of the body where we have the most sensitivity. Right? Uh, so this is uh, sort of a trivially appealing idea that there are big areas of the brain devoted to representing information from the areas that uh, we are more interested in, in encoding. And, uh, and so um, um, clearly having a similar system in a rodent model uh, is very attractive. And in addition, this organization, which preserves the topography of the uh, face all the way through to the cortex, including the intermediate stages, has been, is, has, has, uh, has uh, 
aesthetic appeal and has therefore been very seductive to researchers for the past uh, few decades. Um, also, because the, the anatomy is, is essentially fixed, we can then uh, stimulate whiskers and uh, do electrophysiology, record the responses of neurons, and look at what happens when we manipulate the uh, sensory experience of the animal and so on to try to induce changes in these responses. So we can build uh, maps like this contour map that looks like a mountain uh, where we're just plotting the size of the response of a neuron that we're recording, say, here, to the principal whisker expected from the anatomy and to surrounding whiskers. And uh, so this is a sort of a nice system for looking at the spatial organization of responses in the, uh, in the brain. <coughs> now, uh, researchers from past decades have concentrated many on, on this spatial aspect of responses. Now the problem is that in fact there seems to be a lot of stuff going on in the system that is not accounted for by this nice model of spatial organization. And uh, so, uh, just a, a simple numbers argument uh, is probably enough to be suggestive of this. Um, if you look at where the neurons are sitting that innervate the whisker pad, uh, this is a place called the trigeminal ganglion, and you have about uh, up to 200 neurons per whisker, including a, a single whisker here. And then the information goes through two more stages before it gets to the cortex. And uh, uh, by the time you get to the final station before the cortex, which is the thalamus, you have about 250 to 300 neurons <coughs> encoding a single whisker. But when you jump just a single further stage into the barrel cortex, uh, you get about 5,000 6, neurons receiving inputs from this structure. So you get a, a, a factor of 20 increase in the number of neurons representing the same information. So clearly there has to be something very wrong uh, uh, with uh, the way the system is organized that requires a sufficient number of neurons. And, you know, Knowing that this is the cortex, we can immediately think of things that the brain has to do that are probably done in the cortex, such as contextual uh, information, multimodal uh, combination, you know, combining information from, uh, from vision, from touch, and so on. So many of these neurons might be doing elaborate stuff like this, or even taking account of attention uh, in different ways. But uh, the point is that this is the very first stage of processing after the thalamus in the cortex, and even there you already get a factor of 20 increase. So we were interested in, in finding out whether there's uh, other stuff going on, say uh, a more subtle organization of the responses, maybe in the temporal domain, that goes some way towards explaining this uh, increase in complexity uh, through the pathway. So, uh, to, to sort of to try to explain to you the uh, perspective we use, it, it's useful to say just a word about why why the system is important to an animal. So rodents are nocturnal, or they live in dark spaces, like for example in uh, in metro tunnels, right? And uh, so they 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 really uh, are used ecologically to using their tactile system to explore things and to uh, know what's going on around them. Right? So we are eminently visual animals. And for us, it's intuitively very sort of appealing to try to find out things about the visual system. But these animals are essentially tactile animals and olfactory animals. And uh, so they're really good at uh, uh, working on a variety of tasks uh, with this system. So for example, people have designed object location tasks where the animal has to uh, discriminate the location of objects in front of, in front of its whiskers to get a reward. Uh, They've trained animals on gap discrimination using their whiskers, the width, uh, discriminating the width of an aperture in order to get food, or discriminating different textures. So you put the animal on, on a platform here, and you present it with a couple of textures on the opposite side of the gap, and the animal has to figure out the right texture to get food. And on this kind of task, they're about as good as we are. They're about as good as a human fingertip at resolving different, uh, different textures. Okay? And in my lab, we're interested in trying to find out some of the elementary properties that might underlie this capacity of the animals. <coughs> so, how do they do this? Well, um, the uh, whisker system is an eminent example of an active sensing system. Right? So, uh, even our visual system is active in the sense that if we do not move our eyes around, if we don't do micro saccades to move around and sort of build a representation of the scene in front of us, we don't perceive vision. Okay? Uh, 
But uh, the tactile system is even more an example of, of active exploration, right? because we have to run our fingers along things to try to find out what the uh, surface is. And even more so in the case of this system, where the animal, uh, in many cases, has to actively move its whiskers around in order to touch things and, and find out what they are. So when it does this, for example, if you do an experiment where you present sandpaper with a, uh, different textures, so, for example, this is fine sandpaper, this is rough sandpaper. And you then measure the uh, trajectory of the whisker as it's running along the sandpaper. What you find is something like this, where I'm plotting the velocity of the whisker against time, uh, projected onto the, uh, uh, onto the principal uh, axis of motion of the whisker. Okay? And what you find is these fluctuations in velocity. And, of course, a smooth surface is going to produce a smooth changes in velocity, but rough surfaces produce these very uh, 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 striking uh, temporal patterns of fluctuation. And if the animal is going to do its job of discriminating these different textures, the neurons in its cortex have to be able to discriminate between these particular patterns of fluctuations produced by the different stimuli. Okay? So in other words, what the system needs to be able to do is to uh, uh, figure out the differences between these patterns of fluctuations. <clears throat> and so neurons in the system need to be sensitive to temporal features, and that's sort of the, uh, the uh, underlying assumption that we make that, that, uh, about what we need to explain in our, in our work. Um, so ever since the 1970s, uh, uh, people have used stimuli like these, so discrete stimuli, well separated in time, to look at how responses are organized in the system. And they've discovered a few principles. So one principle is that it's an incredibly temporally precise system. Uh, another principle is that uh, the way neurons are, the sensitivity of neurons is to the velocity of the whiskers. And another principle is that there's very high synchrony in the system. That is, many neurons fire together in order to get messages from the whiskers to the, uh, to the uh, cortex. But these principles have been explored, as I was saying, mainly using stimuli like, like these, which are not very representative of the situations that the animal encounters in real life, and in fact are very simplified. So one, one question that one may ask is, you know, is this, are the neurons in the system essentially linear things that, uh, where we use stimuli like these and we can predict their entire range of responses, or is something more interesting going on if we use more complex stimuli? Um, and, uh, and so one might imagine that uh, this simple picture could be altered by changes in the kind of stimuli, in the environment within which the uh, stimuli are received, uh, and of course by contextual factors having to do with the animal's behavior, or even with changes in brain state which we can't really control for, and so I'm just calling them internal context as a way of not calling them noise or variability that is not under the experimental control. Right? And uh, to try to keep things simple, what we do in the lab is we concentrate on sensory context. So we concentrate on, if you like, the background of the stimulus, how the background interferes with the particular uh, 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 stimulus properties that, or, or uh, response properties that we want to measure. So, okay, so then how do the basic response properties uh, discovered using simple stimuli generalize to complex stimuli? So the first one is that dynamic neurons are, are highly precise in time. So using stimuli like this, people found that uh, responses were less, were within, were, had a precision of uh, better than one millisecond in the calibers. So instead of using stimuli like these, we did uh, very similar recordings using anesthetized rodents and using uh, microelectrode arrays like this one you see here. We just stick it into the thalamus of the animal and we record the responses of the live animal to a stimulus that we, uh, that we supply. But instead of using this stimulus waveform, we use just a noise, a filter of noise stimulus waveform. Okay? Under these conditions, this is the kind of thing we find. <clears throat> so this is a raster plot where we find where what I'm plotting here is each dot is a spike fired by a neuron that we're recording, re recording from in time. And these are different repeats of the, uh, of the same stimulus. So you can see that on different repeats, the uh, temporal precision of the response is really very high, except I haven't really plotted the uh, time scale. Yet. So let me show you what the uh, standard deviation of one of these peaks is. <coughs> 
with temporal units. And you can see that it's really better than one millisecond. In fact, the standard deviation of a Gaussian fit to this is 0.4 milliseconds. So it's really incredibly <coughs> precise. In fact, much more precise than the visual system of human. The noise is always the same. Did I say the noise is always the same in each trial? Yeah, yeah, it's frozen noise in order for us to be able to compute this. Yeah. Um, so okay, so temporal precision is still is still true. Um, the next point is, I told you that uh, people believe that neurons are sensitive to velocity in the system and that activation is highly synchronous. So um, let's see whether that's preserved with these more complex stimuli. So again, instead of using this, or rather, sorry. Um, so just to say one word about, about, syn about synchronicity, what I mean here is, is uh, synchronous activity evoked by a stimulus. So I'm not talking about uh, uh, synchronous if you like, spontaneous synchronization, but stimulus dependent synchronization. So what people do is they apply stimuli like these, and then they find that upon stimulus onset, the neurons, so these are two neurons, they're firing at different times, as you can see in the spontaneous activity, but uh, when the uh, stimulus is applied, they tend to line up again. And of course, one reason for this is that a stimulus like this tends to bias responses to be more similar, right? Because uh, Whatever the sensitivity of the neuron is, you can expect that all the neurons are going to respond after a discontinuity in the stimulus. And what we are after is yeah, what happens under more general conditions. These are two different neurons uh, recording in the thalamus. Uh, two different examples of two different neurons recording in the thalamus. Well, so uh, uh, both responding to the same thing. How does the, the animal, is the animal, how does the animal move the whisker actually? Is it just by moving the head or, or is it also... No, the, the, animal, the animal moves them actively, so it does something called whisking, it moves them like this, mm -hmm. uh, and whisking is under very active regulation, so it can modulate the, uh, the amplitude of the whisking motion, it can modulate also its frequency between in the 5 hertz to 20 hertz range, um, and uh, and the modulation seems to be very linked to sort of the kind of, uh, uh, if you like, behavioral state that the animal is in. Where, whether it's really paying attention, whether it's really focusing on something, um, it changes the amplitude of the whistle motion. For example, if it, if it wants to just detect things around it, it sort of moves like this. But if it wants to focus on one particular feature, one fine feature of a stimulus, it really sort of um, focuses its whisking on that particular area. So. When you say sensitive to velocity, what do you mean then? Because uh, the animal is moving the, the whisker, so it, it measures some force applied in the whisker? Or the right. So, uh, okay, so all I'm going to show you is uh, we're not trying to reproduce the active whisking, we're just stimulating the whisker passively in an anesthetized animal. So in my moving the, the animal is anesthetized in my ah. Um, in, uh, uh, whereas these were well, okay, yeah, that does not introduce complications. In my experience, the, the animal is an And how do you do it mechanically? We do it mechanically with a piezoelectric stimulator. Mm -hmm. So it's not the whisker that's moving. It's not that you're going to apply a signal to the whisker. Mm -hmm. Not in this case. In, in this case, in the uh, the about the noise, how do you do the noise? Uh, the we, signal, how is this signal introduced into the yeah. With a piezoelectric simulator. Um, with these experiments that I showed you before, mm -hmm. that other people did, this is recorded by stimulating the nerve that moves mm -hmm. the whiskers and the animal moves its whiskers along the surface, yes. and you get this kind of thing. So I was saying that neurons need to be able to be good at discriminating these fluctuations. Uh, mm -hmm. But the experiments that we did try to find out what the neurons are sensitive to, we do with anesthetized animals using passive stimulation. One question. So the, the transduction um, between a mechanical movement right, and the yeah, yeah, the other thing you have many, in the force. You have probably many neurons between your thalamus and, and, the, and the sensor itself. Right? There's two stages between the thalamus and the sensor. So now the so there's one. The first neurons live here and they they project to the uh, whisker pad. And then they, they have a connection at the next stage, and then at the thalamus. So the thalamus is two synapses away from the uh, from the uh, first point from the point of transduction. Um, 
The other thing is we don't know a lot. We know a little bit, but not, not a lot about um, the properties of the neurons located here. In particular, we don't know. We don't know what. We don't really know well what the force transduction mechanism is. How they get their. Uh, how they get their properties from the. Uh, uh, you know, where the neurons, even in this first area, are sensitive to a particular feature such as velocity, and if so, what the relationship of that is to how the neurons innervate the uh, follicle of the whisker. You know, so whether the whisker is pooling, can we predict the response of the neuron? That can, that, that's uh, still a, an, open, an open issue. Okay, so... Um, Good. So, um, so people have really liked this idea of stimulus-induced synchrony in responses, and the reason is that uh, on its own, it seems like the uh, 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 response produced by a thalamic neuron onto a cortical neuron in the system is very weak. Okay. So, this is a response measured between two connected neurons. One was in the thalamus, one was in the cortex. When the thalamic neuron fired, it it generated this depolarization in the membrane potential of the cortical neuron. And you can see that the uh, size of the response is about half a millivolt. And this is way too small to be able to induce an action potential and an electrical response in the, uh, in the cortical neuron. So people have thought, okay, you need, you know, if, if this is the size of a typical response, then you need uh, 20 or 30 dynamic neurons firing at the same time in order to. Uh, get any kind of, of uh, information through to the cortex. Right? And sure enough, if you do a simultaneous recording of a, of a cortical neuron and a thalamic neuron, and the thalamic neuron is firing, you see very little effect in the, uh, in the uh, response, in the recording of the cortical neuron, where you can see very little effect of these spikes on the membrane potential. Um, so, so people have liked this idea that it gets the message across. On the other hand, uh, this is kind of an unpleasant model for uh, sensory communication, right? And the reason is that you have two or three hundred neurons, a small number of neurons, which is already an information bottleneck, driving a much bigger number of neurons. And in addition, you're saying, well, it seems that the principles of the system require that, you know, 40 of those 200 neurons have to be firing at the same time to get the uh, big system <coughs> to respond, right? It seems like the, it, it, seems to be designed in an anti-optimal way, if you like, right? So, so you know, uh, this made me wonder, okay, so to what, to what extent uh, uh, do neurons all do the same thing? To what extent are thalamic neurons all synchronous? And do they really respond to the same stimulus properties? And in order to address this question, uh, we, I, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about sort of the principles underlying, underlying what we did. So, since um, the early 1950s, it's been known that neurons respond to elementary physical properties of the stimulus. Right? So, for example, in the visual system, we know that retinal neurons respond to stimulation of a particular region in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, field of vision. Right? Um, and this is known as the receptive field for historical reasons. And the, the concept was generalized by Hebel and Wiesel in the, 19, in the late 1950s in research, which he actually noted won a, a Nobel Prize. And uh, hopefully if this works. So the noises you can hear are the spikes fired by a neuron in the cat visual cortex of an anesthetized animal. And the experiment is really incredibly simple. They have the anesthetized cat, it's, sit, it's sitting there, and this is just a sheet. So the animal is looking at the sheet, and the researchers are waving a wand of light onto different areas of the sheet, and noticing that the neuron of the cat is firing responses depending on what, what motion they use of this wand. Right? So, of course, this experiment was... Uh, incredibly attractive because the implication was that single neurons in the brain respond to the <coughs> features of a visual scene that are quite uh, easy to understand in terms of our visual experience. Right? When the wand is moving this way, then it's within this small area 
in the visual scene, that's when the neuron responds. And so this immediately tells you that you know, somehow a visual perception is made up of responses of lots and lots of neurons like, the, like these, which then sort of somehow become associated to create a picture of the visual world. Right? So it has to be the end of the wand. It can't be the whole thing. And so this is a beautiful experiment, right? And it's historically incredibly important. And of course, they have a huge advantage, right? And the huge advantage is what I told you before. This is the visual system. And intuitively, we know what the visual system does because it relates to our own experience. But we have no idea of what the whisker system is doing. So we have to apply a different approach. The approach we have to apply is instead of knowing stimulus features a priori that may be important in the system, we have to um, 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 essentially follow a, a much more unbiased approach and just use an unbiased distribution of stimuli, you know, present lots and lots of stimuli, and then uh, uh, look within this distribution of stimuli and see what fire the neurons, right? So, in other words, our approach can be very simply summarized in the following way. Again, we have a noise stimulus like this one. Um, oh, sorry, there's one detail I have, to, I have to tell you, which is the following one. Um, actually, sorry, the uh, order of this slide is, 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 is incorrect. It should go before. Anyway, what I'm going to show you here are two different neurons responding to the noise stimulus. And again, the same kind of plot, the same kind of raster plot, where uh, we're lining up the responses in time on different repeats of the same stimulus. And you can see that although both neurons are very precise, as I told you before, each neuron fires at very different times. And so this already makes you suspect that they probably respond to different aspects of the stimulus, because it's, it's the very same stimulus for both neurons. Fine. So this is what I, I wanted to tell you. So instead of, instead of using a stimulus where we know uh, what's important to the neurons a priori, we can come up with a big, a big uh, distribution of stimuli that vary along different, uh, uh, along different uh, uh, dimensions. And so, of course, uh, this isn't a random distribution of stimuli, but in, in any case, you get the idea. We present lots and lots and lots of stimuli. And if a neuron happens to be sensitive to one stimulus dimension, dimension for example, color, then we will end up doing an analysis where we, where just a reduced fraction of all these stimulus values evoke a response. And those values vary along the color axis, which is the one that the neuron cares about. So for example, if it's a neuron that only cares about color, and it only fires to the color green, then we will get these dots here, and we can then uh, just collapse <laughs> the responses onto the relevant dimension that uh, uh, causes the, the responses, and uh, we will see that the response probability depends on the waveform of light, in other words, on the colors present in the sea. And this is the kind of analysis we're going to do. So, um, so sorry for that uh, <coughs> change in order. So we have this noise stimulus, we have the neuron firing spikes, and then all we need to do is we need to look at the stimulus values before the neuron fired each spike, and uh, compare those, uh, that, the, that distribution of stimulus values with the original, with the prior distribution of values uh, that, that is generic to the experiment. Okay? So, do you manage to get the stimulus to a single neuron, or is it to an area? Well, the stimulus is applied to the whiskers, and we then record it from single neurons. No, the stimulus is the whiskers. Mm -hmm. And we record from single neurons. It's not what I used before. I thought you said before we applied the stimulus to a, to a single neuron. Mm -hmm. I said, I think you said the animal was anesthetized. The animal was anesthetized, we stimulate the whiskers, and we record from neurons in the thalamus. So there are several stages in between. We don't know what's happening in the stages. So you cannot make sure that the, the two neurons are getting the same stimulus, direct like stimulus. That's correct. And yeah, it, so it's not necessarily something that's intrinsic to the neurons, it's something that's intrinsic to the pathway at the end of which is each of the neurons. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, so when we do this, <coughs> so let me step back j just again for a moment. And uh, so imagine that, so I've been telling you that some neurons might be velocity sensors, right? So how, how would a velocity sensor behave under this kind of analysis? It would essentially behave as uh, as a neuron that filters out uh, rate of change in the stimulus, right? Um, so, uh, so to sort of to represent this 
perhaps in a better way, if a neuron is sensitive to, uh, so here are the fluctuations in the stimulus, and the neuron is sensitive to large changes in, posi in Wister position, then when we uh, average all these changes together, uh, the average, the spike triggered average of the neuron is going to look like a differential filter, okay? And, oops, and uh, if we take into account the uh, autocorrelation function of the stimulus, the way that the filter would look for our experimental conditions is like this, okay? This is how an ideal instantaneous velocity sensor would look. And uh, here's one of our recorded neurons. So it looks just like the ideal velocity filter, except it switched backwards. And the reason for that is, here the differential is going from down to up, so it corresponds to the downward to upward whisker motion. And this neuron is sensitive to the opposite. It's sensitive to a motion of the whiskers going from up to down. Okay? So this, this neuron is sensitive to whisker velocity in a particular direction. That's what this analysis tells us. Similarly, we can define what the ideal position sensor would be under these conditions of, uh, under this uh, uh, stimulus resolution. Uh, and this is what one of our recorded neurons looks like. And so we can go through our entire recorded data set and try to explain uh, the uh, feature selectivity of our neurons based on, on, on this analysis. Yeah? What happens if you push a whisker in one direction and then you let it for a while push it in the other direction? Do you get one spike in one? and not uh, spike in the other? Uh, the, uh, the answer is uh, yes, with some qualifications. For these particular neurons in the thalamus, that's mostly true. Yeah. Because from the, from the protocol that we are using, it's not clear to me that they, they sense uh, velocity in one particular direction. That they sense velocity in one particular direction? You said that the, the velocity is sensing only when it goes in one direction. But it was not clear to me that that's the case in the protocol that we are using from these traces. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, just from this drawing that I made, I mean, at a superficial level, the, the answer is, if the neuron responds to motion going from up to down, this is how the average is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And if it's sensitive to uh, motion going from down to up, say if it's sensitive to changes like this, then in the end you're going to get a filter that looks like this. It looks the opposite to this one. But in fact, the complete answer to your question is not clear yet. So let me uh, advance for a couple of minutes and then we will have a better answer. Um, okay, so in the end we can, we can, uh, we can uh, build a, a histogram of, of uh, what the neurons are sensitive to and it turns out that only about 25% of all neurons are purely sensitive to velocity. So we have sensitivity to uh, several orders of uh, derivatives of the stimulus, uh, position, velocity, acceleration, and even higher derivatives. And, uh, and also some uh, more complicated neurons that I won't go into. And so, um, so uh, the prediction for this kind of analysis, uh, which uh, addresses your question of just a second ago, is that uh, uh, neurons will be sensitive to just one direction when you uh, move the whiskers uh, in one direction and then back again. Uh, position and velocity selective neurons will look will have responses that look very similar to this kind of stimulus, uh, and yet responses to a more complex stimulus will look very different. And that's exactly how we have the neurons. <coughs> so. Um, then there's another stage in the analysis, which is once we've uh, figured out what kind of physical feature the neurons respond to, we can then construct their tuning curves, uh, which is essentially the same idea as I plotted in, uh, in this example here. Right? Once we've decided what the relevant dimension is, which is what we've been doing with position versus velocity and so on, we can predict what the uh, uh, probability of response of the neuron is going to be uh, uh, as we vary uh, parametrically the relevant dimension, right? In this case, the colors. So when we do that for the dynamic neurons, uh, this is what this is the kind of thing we get. So these are this is a velocity sensitive neuron. This is something that looks more position sensitive. This is something that's a mixture of the two, and so on. And these are the tuning functions that predict the firing rate of the neuron 
uh, uh, in response to the projection of the stimulus onto the uh, filter corresponding to that neuron. Right? In other words, we're modeling the neuron as a, as a feature detector, which basically convolves the stimulus with its preferred filter, and then the result of that convolution is a number, and depending on that number, the neuron is going to fire a spike more probably or less probably. Okay? Um, and this model, by the way, works really well in characterizing sensory neurons across many, many systems. It works in the visual system quite well, it works in the auditory system. It's a nice model that people are using um, very often in neuroscience now. Um, and so, uh, you can see that for many, for many of these neurons, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six different neurons, for many of them the response starts around zero and it sort of goes up uh, progressively so that the neuron is essentially encoding the value of the uh, chosen stimulus feature. The neuron is basically a feature encoder in the thalamus. So this sort of agrees with the intuitive notion that before we get to the cortex, neurons in the pathway are sort of faithfully transmitting the value of a stimulus, and then you can process that stimulus more in the cortex to, uh, to create the perception. <coughs> so that's the, uh, these are the conclusions of part one of the talk. I will come back to some of this later. Um, so for the second part of the talk, which I hope will be brief, um, uh, I'm going to talk about adaptation, which is a fundamental, uh, almost universal aspect of, of neuronal responses. And it was first described by Lord Adrian, working in Cambridge in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, he was the person who actually, uh, working with very basic instrumentation, he figured out most of the essential principles of, of sensory coding. So the way he did that was he just hung a weight on a frog leg, right, and looked at uh, stretch receptor neurons uh, responding to the weight that, that was uh, hung from the leg. And uh, the first principle that he found is that as you increase the weight uh, hanging off the leg, you get um, more and more of these funny little waveforms, which we, as we now know, are uh, action potentials that have a stereotypical waveform, and this is the coding scheme used by the nervous system, right? Uh, the basic coding scheme is you change the number and you change the temporal location of uh, action potentials, uh, and, and, and that's essentially the sensory theory in the neural code. But he found another principle, which is that as you maintain for many seconds a stimulus, uh, the response gets smaller and smaller, and the size of this accommodation or adaptation of the response depends on the, uh, on the uh, magnitude of the stimulus in the first place. Right? And uh, extensions of adaptation have been found basically everywhere, and it has some uh, 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 useful effects on, on coding. For example, one aspect of adaptation is adaptation to luminance level that we know from our own experience. You know, when, you, when it's summer and you enter a dark room from the, uh, from the outside and it's, it's a sunny day, at the beginning we don't see anything and eventually our photoreceptors get used to the uh, mean luminance level. And in the visual system this happens to many stimulus dimensions, not just luminance, but also contrast and so on. So this matches the range of responses to the range of stimuli, and this is very useful because, for example, in the visual system, the uh, range of possible energy levels that the uh, visual system is confronted with is much, much bigger than the dynamic range, the possible dynamic range of visual responses at any stage in the visual system. So this is the only way that you can get a neural, a neural system to convey uh, the full range of stimuli. Another aspect of adaptation is that it, it, it can enhance responses to novel stimuli. So you present the stimulus many times, and the response gets smaller. <coughs> if you actually present the new stimuli, in many systems the response actually gets bigger than the initial one. So it gives you a, a response to surprise or to novel to a new frequent stimulus. Uh, so, so there is some instances in which the response is proportional to the volume of the intensity of the stimulus you receive. To the ordering of the to the of the no, no, no. Like for example, in the auditory system, you what basically what, ma what matters is the ordering of the intensity, not the intensity. Mm -hmm. For the response that you were showing of the way, it's a kind of wind. I mean, it's not on the ordering because the, it's more kind of uh, close to the to the wind response. You mean this one. Yeah, because uh, the difference between uh, 0 0.5 and 3 grams, for example, there is very big, and the ordering of both of them is not so different. So it's not so, I guess that there is different, different schemes, but this scheme doesn't seem to be the same, for example, than auditory responses in that system. There's very different schemes, there's also different schemes for different neurons within a, within a given system. Um, but 
this. And this is coded on the neuron level or that on the, at, the, at the level of the diva of the system, of the auditory system. Or the there are some examples where uh, people have found that uh, the uh, law of responses to the laboratory or stimulus intensity or whatever it is is also fulfilled. So this is a psychophysical law, it happens with our perception, but it's also fulfilled in some neurons of the cortical neuron. Um, but for this particular system, I don't think anybody has really uh, um, been able to find such a relationship. Um, I mean, uh, anyway, so just to remind you of the kinetic signatures of the stimuli, they need to neurons need to respond to these temporal fluctuations. And so, in the context of adaptation, we wondered uh, to what extent is a given event, a given a given motion in the stimulus, a given fluctuation. Uh, represented in a way that depends on its background. In other words, is the sensitivity of a neuron to this black thing bigger when it's presented against a smaller background, or is it always the same? Right? Is the sensitivity of a neuron always the same? So to look at this, we uh, presented this, uh, again, a noise stimulus, but this time with a changing uh, uh, amplitude. Uh, and so we had slow changes in the overall amplitude of the stimulus distribution, uh, on a five second time scale, and these were coupled with the fast, or these were uh, uh, on a different time scale from the fast fluctuations uh, within each of the uh, periods. And so, when these statistics change, we can ask the question is the uh, sensitivity of, of a neuron within this period different to the sensitivity within this period? So, when we measure the response of the neuron, the evolution of the firing rate, we see that when it goes, when the stimulus goes from low to high, there's a big jump in the firing rate, the response then gets smaller until it sort of arrives at a steady state a couple of seconds later, and then when it goes back from high to low, the response gets, goes, jumps down and then recovers a, li a little bit. And so uh, what we did now is to compare how the neurons uh, constructed their responses in these steady state periods after they were adapted. And so we go through a very similar analysis to the one I just described for you, and uh, the outcome of that analysis is the following. We get these tuning curves, which predict the spike probability in terms of the uh, filtered risk distributions, as we did before. Uh, and what we find is that the low, in, in the low variance period, uh, a stimulus of a given size produces a much greater probability of firing uh, than in the high variance period. Okay? And the nice thing about these curves is that when we then normalize to the standard deviation of the stimulus distribution, the curves look exactly the same. So what this means is that the neurons are normalizing their sensitivity uh, exactly to the standard deviation of the stimulus distribution. So neurons compensate for these changes in stimulus statistics. Um, and uh, this is quite different actually to the tuning curves that I just showed you for the thalamus, because if you notice this is relative spike probability, so, in order for the neuron to be firing spikes above its mean firing rate, you need to push the stimulus almost to two standard deviations, or maybe one and a half standard deviation away from its mean. So these neurons don't really behave as feature encoders like the thalamic neurons I, I just talked to you about. These are cortical neurons, and uh, uh, they behave as really uh, detectors of large, large variations in the stimulus, large events in the stimulus. Okay? Um, so this already points to a change in the kind of thing that these neurons are doing. May I ask a question to that? Yeah. Um, on what time scale does the adaption take place? Well, so this is really interesting and it's not something I can really respond to. Um, the firing rate adaptation takes place on, on a time scale of, basically if you fit an, exp an exponential to this, which isn't always easy, you get about 400 milliseconds of oh. the exponential uh, time course. But there's some evidence that the uh, uh, that this adjustment actually takes place on a faster time scale than the uh, and the change of firing rate. But we weren't able to get a good estimate of this time of the time course for this change in our data because of our insufficient sampling of the spikes. So it's a very noisy fit to, to this model. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to run through actually. So we we have some evidence on 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 how, on the mechanisms underlying this adaptation, but I'm, I'm just going to run through the, these experiments and I'll say something about them at the end, because I don't want to take too long. Good. So, the next obvious thing to, to ask is, is this adaptation the same, or is it different across the pathway, across different stages in the pathway? 
right? I, these data I just showed you were for cortical neurons, but the data I showed you before were for thalamic neurons, so clearly you can do thalamic and cortical experiments and, and, and try to compare how adaptation happens at both stages. In fact, we can start from the beginning of the pathway, which is the trigeminal ganglion, and this is where the, first, the very first neurons that innervate the whiskers do. And these neurons, they have no adaptation in firing rate, so the large stimulus makes the firing rate stay up, the small stimulus makes the firing rate stay low, and when you uh, compute these uh, 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 firing rate uh, tuning functions, you find that actually uh, uh, the, the overall scale doesn't change, and the reason why the blue curve doesn't go up higher than this is because, uh, uh, in fact, the, uh, the neurons have, uh, uh, the neuron, uh, basically, with the blue stimulus, with the, small, with the low amplitude stimulus, we didn't push the neuron uh, hard enough that we uh, explored this, this range of its responses. But uh, what we find is that the curves don't, don't really change in scale. So they respond to the, to the stimulus in absolute terms. Yes. Is the, do they still respond to uh, velocity? Uh, do they still respond to velocity? That's variable, and so um, let me respond to that at the end of the year. Uh, at the end of the year. <coughs> so now the interesting thing is that the, at the thalamic level, some neurons. So first of all, the firing rate curves are much harder to interpret than at the cortical stage. So. For example, I showed you the, the clean uh, rate adaptation for the cortical neurons a moment ago. That you can see. Oops. Here, right? So this, is, this can be easily interpreted in terms of the response adapting, getting smaller here and recovering here. But this is definitely not the case for something like this. We, we, we don't really know what's going on here. Why is the response getting bigger? So, um, but what is it easy to interpret is the response curves uh, or the characterization of the, uh, of the response in terms of the stimulus, where a, given, a stimulus of a given size always evokes the same rate, <coughs> uh, regardless of whether it was within the uh, 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 small distribution or the uh, wide distribution. Okay? So this neuron isn't restraining. Here's another neuron. Again, the firing rate is not transparent at all, what it's doing. But when we run through the analysis, we can see that this particular neuron did rescale its, its, uh, its <coughs> spike probability so that uh, this neuron is sensitive to the whistle stimulus in normalized units instead of absolute units. So this means that as you go up the pathway, this is another thing that's changing. right? So uh, trigeminal ganglion neurons are sensitive to the stimulus in, in absolute scale. Um, the thalamic neurons are, you find neurons that are both sensitive to the absolute scale and to the relative stimulus. And by the time you get to the cortex, all the neurons are sensitive to the stimulus in the relative scale. So as we go up to the cortex, we find an increasing invariance of responses to scale, for example. And you can uh, you can imagine that this is useful in the sense that uh, uh, building a percept of uh, an object of a particular pattern or a particular sequence of fluctuations uh, should be uh, invariant with regard to things like the overall amplitude of the whisker motion. If I'm exploring a surface and going like this, ideally I should be able to uh, recognize the texture independent of whether the, the motion of my whisker is, is, is large or is smaller or is faster or slower. Right? Um, so uh, ideally, this gives you this gives cortical neurons a way to represent fluctuations in a scale environment. Um, now, the second point that this slide makes is actually that neurons uh, share very similar biophysical mechanisms at every stage in the pathway. And the slides I jumped over, what they did was they showed that the intrinsic properties of neurons, the membrane properties of neurons, are enough to uh, be able to give you this rescaling of oops, this rescaling of the uh, of the uh, sensitivity as long as you drive them with the right stimulus. And so the suggestion is that the biophysical mechanisms are very similar at each stage in the pathway, and the reason why here you get relative sensitivity and here you don't, or you only do so some of the time, is that these neurons are driven by a different effective stimulus than these neurons closer to the whiskers. 
So, um, um, I hope to have convinced you that uh, the uh, response properties of neurons in this pathway are actually quite rich and diverse, and that neurons are sensitive to many uh, features, that we can trace how the sensitivity evolves as we go up the pathway from the whiskers to the cortex, uh, that the temporal domain of responses is actually very rich because we find neurons that respond to uh, different uh, stimulus dynamics. Um, there's unsuspected diversity at, at the thalamic level, and responses are modulated by sensory context, uh, uh, such as the adaptive responses that I showed you, that are uh, modular where sensitivity is modulated by the overall scale of the distribution of stimuli. Um, so there's another point that I, 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 I wanted to say, which is related to, um, uh, to something I repeated at the talk, which is this notion that even though modulated by context, thalamic neurons are essentially uh, feature encoders, so they respond to or they, they encode, they represent the value of a particular uh, 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 aspect of stimulus kinetics, if you like, like velocity or position. Uh, but cortical neurons are much more into the uh, business of detecting surprising things, detecting outliers and stimulus. And uh, these, this difference between thalamic and cortical neurons is, we think, uh, an essential aspect of what makes the cortex different and why different and why you need all these stages of, of processing. <coughs> um, so uh, we think that another thing, another point that's worth investigating is this idea that we have uh, very varied uh, feature encoding properties at the thalamic level. So you have some neurons that encode. Uh, something like velocity, some neurons that encode something that's harder to identify, some have uh, responses that change their scale according to the stimulus distribution, some don't, and cortical neurons have all these dynamic inputs to choose from, and presumably what neurons in the cortex are doing is they're detecting some essentially random, from the point of view of the experiment, the combination of features that are present in the stimulus at any given time. And, uh, I want to finish with that and, uh, and uh, address any, any further questions that you may have. I'd also like to uh, uh, just uh, tell you who the people were who did the work. Uh, Andrea Linda did uh, some in vivo recordings, uh, the ones I've showed you and additional ones that I'm, I'm not going to go into. Uh, Marta did uh, slice recordings where she showed that uh, the intrinsic properties of neurons were enough to produce the three state of sensitivity. Um, and uh, we have uh, our collaborators who have been essential to, to this work also. So, um, thank you very much. You started your talk showing that you generalize the stimulus from these regular stimuli uh, to, to noise stimuli. In linear system theory, you would do that in order to determine, let's say, the transfer function in the system. And, and then, at least in your case, you can determine, let's say, the kind of filtering uh, that the thalamic neurons uh, perform. If you change the representations of the noise you drive your whiskers, once you know the filters, how large is the predictability that you have on the response that the, yeah. that the, the neuron will have in the thalamus? So in the thalamus, the predictability is quite good, and also the model is quite simple. It's just a single filter, like the one that I showed you is enough. Um, the, uh, so for example, if you, so the, the easiest thing you can do, right, is you can just look at, uh, uh, at, at similar noise, but not the same noise wave. For and, and there, if we predict the responses, the, the, we, get, we get a pretty good correlation between the predicted responses <coughs> and the actual responses. Say up to um, uh, correlation coefficient of uh, 0.8.9 almost uh, But that's for a very similar noise, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the key thing is is that the uh, the uh, autocorrelation of, of the noise that uh, of this of this particular kind of noise is very different to that of the natural stimuli. And we haven't really done done a very controlled extension of the results. The first, the first thing you will do, you will do two things to the kind of model we have. Mm -hmm. The first thing is you will include some kind of, of term to account for adaptation, because what we did with adaptation is we just looked at different steady states, different adapted steady states, but we didn't include anything in the model to make it follow the adaptation. Mm -hmm. The second 
The second thing you would include is you would actually go to a bigger number of filters. Because as soon as... Um, so, I mean, the simplest possible uh, number of... The, the, the smallest possible number of dimensions that you need for a model like this is you need at least two points, right? In space, I mean, this is in, in obviously in time. But if you, uh, if you chop up your stimulus into different time bins, then here what we're really doing is we're comparing the value of the stimulus at time two and time one, right? Mm -hmm. And we're saying that the important thing is the difference. So this is a very simple form of dimensional reduction. But you can take this to any order you want, right? So you could go, in practice, if you're looking at a, at a long uh, stimulus, uh, you might want to go to a bigger number of dimensions to see whether it's responsive to changes in the stimulus, but also higher derivatives and so on. And when you do that again, you, for many points, you, you improve your ability to Oh, so one thing. In cortex, in, this is true for thalamus, but in mm -hmm. cortex, uh, you do a clearly poorer job. And in mm -hmm. particular, the single, the single filter, so the single, the reduction to just a single dimension, doesn't work for any cortical neurons. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and you can you can immediately predict that from the uh, you know the tuning functions, the input output functions that I showed, which are bilaterally symmetric. Mm -hmm. That means that the neurons respond to both positive and to negative deviations. So if you average those together, obviously you're going to get zero, and the, the, uh, the model has no predictability. So you need to go to higher dimension. Mm -hmm. Thank you again.